The first Bible verse I ever memorized was John 3.16 from the King James Version of the Bible. Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sounds like it's the first Bible verse you ever memorized. (laughs) Two. And certainly one of the best known and best loved verses in all of Scripture. Sometimes you see people at sporting events holding up posters with that reference on it. John 3.16. You might find it scrawled on a bathroom wall or spray painted on the side of a bridge. I saw it last week on the back of a truck rolling down Interstate 95, John 3.16, as if you could do evangelism simply by citing chapter and verse. But if you were going to do it, John 3.16 is not a bad chapter and verse to cite, is it? Martin Luther called it the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. And it's that word gospel that I want to talk about this morning. It wasn't even a word before Jesus came along. You could have good news and you could share good news. But when Mark wrote his gospel, he said, this is the good news about Jesus Christ, the evangelion, from which we get the words evangel and evangelism and evangelical. All of these are derived from the good news about Jesus Christ, which is why a recent article in Christian Century stopped me in my tracks. It was called Bad News Evangelicals. And it was written by a man named Rodney Clapp who suggested that the people we call evangelicals in America are often more interested in the bad news than in the good news. It stopped me in my tracks because we are evangelicals, we Baptists. I use that word in the best and broadest sense to mean that we are good news people. We are great commission Christians. We want to share the story of Jesus with everybody in the whole world. Mr. Clapp himself, who wrote the article, could be described as an evangelical Christian. So I have to ask, why would he say such a thing? He said he was prompted to write the article by the recent forced resignation of Richard Sizek as vice president of governmental affairs for the National Association of Evangelicals. He writes, in 2007, Sizek was roundly condemned by some conservative evangelical political activist because of his attempts to raise concerns about global warming among evangelicals. Late last year, Sizek, in a radio interview, spoke cautiously in favor of the legalization of civil unions, though not marriage, for gays. The consequent firestorm resulted in Sizek's resignation. What this episode reveals, Clapp writes, is conservative evangelicalism's deeply reactionary tendencies. He noted that the movement we call fundamentalism was born in reaction against some of the methods of biblical scholarship in the late 19th century and also against some of the new discoveries of scientific inquiry. These same fundamentalists later reacted against the social gospel in America so strongly that they practically removed from the biblical gospel any concern for the poor, any thought for liberating those who were oppressed. In the middle of the last century, conservative evangelicals were galvanized by strong anti-communist sentiments and as a predominantly white movement, both then and now, they were slow to support civil rights for blacks. Every once in a while, conservative evangelicals get so worked up about what's gone wrong in the world, they believe the world is coming to an end. I remember in the 70s reading The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, which was not only an exercise in creative eschatology, but also a reaction against the Soviet Union, 
European unification, and the ecumenical movement. More recently, the Left Behind series has sought to rescue American conservative Christians from Arabic terrorist, one world government, and moral decline. But aside from all that, Clapp notes that the evangelical media has been playing defense for years, arming the faithful against religious cults, then the New Age movement, then feminism, then secular humanism, and so on and so on. Still, he says, American evangelicalism appears to be strong. How can I say it is in trouble? It is in deep trouble, Clapp says, because it faces a significant cultural and generational shift. Identifying itself with the political right, the movement cannot easily shake the image of being primarily negative and destructive. Indicators show that it is losing attractiveness, not only among unconverted fellow Americans, but among its own young. More significantly, Clapp says, and this is where I want you to lean in close and listen, evangelicalism is in deep trouble because the gospel really is good news. And reactionaries are animated by bad news, by that which they stand against. He quotes John Howard Yoder, whose words appear in this morning's bulletin. For a practice to qualify as evangelical in the functional sense means, first of all, that it communicates news. It says something particular that would not be known and could not be believed were it not said. Second, it must mean that this news is attested as good. It comes across to those whom it addresses as helping, as saving, and as shalom. Today's gospel lesson from the third chapter of John is overflowing with that kind of evangelicalism. In verse 16, John tells us that God loved the world so much he gave his only son so that anyone who believes in Jesus will not die an everlasting death but live an everlasting life. That's good news. But then, just to make sure we don't get confused, he says in verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So where does all this bad news come from? God isn't trying to condemn anyone. God is trying to save everyone. In verse 18, John says, those who believe in him are not condemned. And then... With the first hint of bad news in the whole passage, he says, those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And again, even though it's condemnation we are talking about, it is also clear that it isn't God who is doing the condemning. This is the judgment, John says, That the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Do you hear what John is saying? He's not saying that God will someday sit on his throne to judge the world, inviting some people to participate in the paradise of heaven while sending others off to experience the punishment of hell. In a very real sense, he is saying that the judgment has already come. Light has come into the world, the true light that enlightens every person, the one who called himself the light of the world. And while it was his intention to save everyone, there were some people who saw him coming and ran the other way because their deeds were evil, because they didn't want them to be exposed by the light. 